Hi everyone, I'm Shaylin here with Reedsy. Today we're doing another Q&A video. We did the first of these a couple months ago. And these videos are just a chance uh, for you guys to ask questions that you've been having, maybe bring up an issue you've been having with writing. Hopefully I can answer as many of them as possible. I'm gonna start with some questions that you guys sent in on YouTube. So the first question here is a bit longer. I'm just gonna read the whole thing. How do I format my book when I first start writing? Say I'm writing with multiple perspectives. Do I start writing in each separate character's head or do I just do an overview of what will happen and then adapt it to their personalities? And do I section it into chapters right away or write it all as millions of paragraphs and then separate it later? Let's address the first question. Should you write it in their personalities or write an overview and then adapt it? Writing in an objective point of view and then adding in the personalities later sounds like the hardest way you could possibly write a book. I mean, if someone out there does that and it works for you, cool. I would never recommend that to anyone. I've never met a writer who writes that way. I think it would be incredibly difficult and you'd be creating so much extra work for yourself. The character's perspective and point of view is really intrinsically layered into a story. If you were to write it objectively first and try to layer the point of views over top, First of all, it'd probably be quite clunky and difficult to do that second draft, but you'd also, you'd basically just have to rewrite it. If you want an overview of the events, then I would just recommend making an outline, you know, a list of scenes or a list of chapters so you have some guidance, but I would 100% recommend just writing it in the character's point of view from the beginning. As for how to section it into chapters, personally, I I break my book into chapters as I'm writing it. Um, that's what I think most people do. You don't have to plan them out in advance, but typically I think it's easiest to, while you're writing, if you get to a point where it feels like a chapter should break here, then I would end the chapter. It's, again, one of those things where you just be making more work for yourself. If you write a whole book without breaking into chapters and then you just have a ton of scenes, it would be quite overwhelming. So I think here you're outlining some options that seem like they're just creating more work for yourself. I would just do the simplest thing, which is to kind of just do it right the first time. How do I give an idea the shape of a good novel? First thing that you want to do is give the idea as much time as it needs. If an idea doesn't feel ready to write, or it doesn't feel like it's the shape of a novel yet, it's probably just because it needs more time to ruminate. It's okay to spend a lot of time thinking over your idea, whether you outline it first or not, to give it the time to develop into a story. However, if you're talking about structure here, if you have an idea and you don't know how to translate that to a novel structure, I would recommend identifying kind of the few key points of your plot structure. So the first one you're gonna want is the inciting incident. Before you have an inciting incident, you don't really have a story. That is the event that changes everything and sets the character on their path towards their goal. We've got a video on that, so I'll leave a link to that in the description. You can also look for your midpoint, which is a turning point in the middle, and the story's climax, which is obviously kind of where the character either succeeds or fails at achieving their goal at the end of the story. Try to find those three things. You can also try breaking it into three acts and that will give you a good sense for your book's shape. Next up is how do I cure my writer's block? We do have a video on this, so I'll also leave that for you to check out. Writer's block is tricky because it all depends on what the cause of the writer's block is. So the way to cure your writer's block is gonna be to identify what's causing the writer's block. If it's cause you're tired and creatively drained, then allow yourself to take a break. If it's cause you're bored or frustrated with your project, then maybe try working on something else or you know, force yourself to work through the difficult part so you get to an easier part of the story with more momentum. If it's because you don't have any ideas, then try actively cultivating some or do some free writes or do some exercises. There's no one general cure-all for um, writer's block, but that's because there's no one thing that necessarily causes it. I've been writing stories since I was in elementary school and always felt confident in my ability until I started learning about the professional writing world. How can I overcome this feeling that my stories will never measure up to the standards of today? Everything feels so judgmental. It does feel very judgmental. Any book that actually has readers will also have scathing reviews. People have really strong opinions about everything and they broadcast them everywhere. And it can feel really overwhelming. It can feel really scary to think about publishing a book in that environment. At a certain point, I think you just have to ask, does my passion for the project outweigh my fear of people judging it? People are always going to judge it. They're going to judge it no matter what you do, no matter what you say, even if you write the best book ever. All you can really do is do your best. Put out work that you're proud of. If you're proud of it at the end of the day, then when people don't like it, at least you have that peace of mind in your heart 
that you're proud of it. And they're trying to write to appeal to other people or in a way that will avoid people disliking your book is essentially impossible. So do your best. That's really all you can do is do your best. Be fueled by your own love for the book. I don't know how helpful or how objective that is. It is a perfectly valid fear. It's one that I get caught up in myself. Sometimes you have to just accept that people are gonna hate your book and that can almost be a very freeing thing to accept. But once you settle with the fact that it's actually okay if people dislike your art, then you'll feel free to actually write the things that you care about the most because you won't be afraid of people disliking them. How do I know if my story should be in first person, past or present tense? With first person especially, the main difference between present and past tense is that it's the difference between a remembering and an experiencing narrator. So present tense is an experiencing narrator meaning that the character is experiencing the story as it is happening. This means that anything they say in their narrative is what they are thinking at the time the story is happening. If you think that's where the most interesting timeline is, if you think the character's thoughts as things are happening are the most relevant, are the most impactful, then you may want to choose present tense. A past tense, on the other hand, is a remembering narrator, meaning that the thoughts the character is conveying are based on how they recall the events, their reflection after the events, how they perceive the events after they're happening. If you think that the most interesting version of your character and the most interesting narrative is as the character is remembering the events, you may want to choose past tense. Present tense, it can be hard to filter what's necessary and what's not, and it can be harder to control the structure and the timeline because the character, literally, the story is happening as the character is experiencing it, meaning you can't really jump around on the timeline as much. You experience your life linearly, right? Whereas a past tense narrator can literally tell the story in whatever order they want. So if you think your story is more linear, present tense can work. If you want it to be very nonlinear, past tense will give you more control over the timeline. When writing thoughts in first person present tense, is it correct to italicize then use an I think clause at the end? By doing that, you're actually doing two things that are redundant. Because you're writing in first person, every single thing in the narrative is a thought, right? Because first person, the character is telling the story, which means they're thinking it. So if you put it in italics, you're separating it from the rest of the narrative kind of for no reason. You're saying, hey, this is a thought, when everything around it is also thought. And then you're also saying, I think which is also unnecessary. If the thought was, I'm hungry, I want to eat an apple. So the way you're saying you would write this would be, in italics, you'd write, I'm hungry, I want to have an apple. And then afterwards you'd say, I think. The way that I would recommend to do that would be none of it in italics and just say, I'm hungry, I want to have an apple. No, I thought. You don't need either of those things. And it's so much smoother to just integrate the thoughts seamlessly into the narrative. Any advice for getting through draft two? First draft was easy, but now I'm stuck on the second and find it so difficult. Oh boy, I also just got through a second draft, so I relate. Two things that I would recommend as someone who just got out of a second draft. First, make an outline. I don't outline my first drafts, but I do outline my revisions. What I find really useful is to break it down by scene. So I have an outline, and for every single scene, I mention the changes that need to happen in that scene. That way you can just approach it piece by piece and it's way less overwhelming. Normally, I'm not someone to suggest tight deadlines, but this is the one draft where honestly, I'd recommend setting tighter deadlines for yourself. And this is why. It is the most painful part of the process. Get it over with. I started a second draft in July and at first it was taking so long. And I realized if I keep up at this rate, I'll be doing this draft for over a year. I looked at every chapter and I guessed, based on how extensive the edits were, how many days it would take to edit that chapter if I edited every day. And then I counted it out, I set myself a deadline, the deadline was like a couple weeks from then, and I made myself stick to that, and then the draft was done, and then I, I could just like take a sigh of relief because I knew that the hardest part of the process was over. What do you do when you have a really good idea but you don't know how to execute it on paper to the standard the idea deserves to be at? This is a worry that seems to plague a lot of people. What I would ask yourself is, do you think that never writing the idea at all is a better service to it than writing it imperfectly? Personally, I think the answer is no. I think writing anything imperfectly 
if it's something you care about and you want to write, probably does a better service to the idea than never writing it because you were afraid to mess it up. No idea is ever gonna turn out as perfectly as it is in your head. In your head it's perfect and it can be scary to disrupt that. It's also not a book in your head, it's just an idea. On one hand, sometimes you have projects that you just know, I'm not ready to write this, I need a bit more time, but I do think I will be ready at a certain point. I need more practice and then I'll be ready to write this. In that case, I'd say sure, hold off, take some time. But if it's a case where you feel, I'm just not good enough, I don't think I ever will be, so I'm scared to write this because I'll be doing it a disservice or I'll mess it up. In that case, you're kind of just shooting yourself in the foot. The only way to learn how to write a book is to actually write it. In some way, you will always be unprepared to write everything you write, and that's good. Every book will be a learning opportunity. If that truly is what's holding you back, just a fear of it being imperfect. You have to embrace the fact that everything you make will be imperfect and that that's okay. In the end, better to write it, mess it up, and make it better later than just never write it at all out of fear. I really want to write a project to occupy me during lockdown, but though I have the motivation to write, I can't think of any book ideas that interest me enough. Is it possible to develop one without waiting on inspiration so I can start writing? It is 100% possible. Um, the project that I'm currently editing the book that I did the second draft of last year and that I hope to actually start querying this year, like it's my favorite thing I've ever written, was not born in a moment of inspiration. That project was born from the fact that I was taking a class on novel writing, it was a workshop, I needed to have pages ready, I was on a deadline and so I had to sit down and force myself to get an idea. It is not the most romantic, idealized way to get a book idea, but there's nothing wrong with it if you need one. The way that I got that idea was I basically just said, sit down at your desk, don't get up until you have a book idea. I started just brainstorming. I wrote down anything that interested me that I thought might be interesting to explore. Character dynamics, images, settings, concepts, literally anything kept writing until I started to see how maybe some of those things could intersect. We actually do have a video where I walk through my whole process for getting a book idea when you literally have nothing, so you can check that out. But it's 100% possible, you know, years down the line when you're publishing your book and you're doing an interview and someone says, oh, where did this idea come from? You're not gonna have a great story, you're just gonna have to go, well, I wanted, I wanted a book idea so I made one happen. But it can totally happen and I am proof that the passion for the project can come after the inspiration. Do you have any tips on writing introspection? Introspection is great. Make sure that it's still grounded in storyline. Too much introspection without connection to something that is physically happening in the world. You know, like if a character is just floating and they're just in their mind thinking, we don't know where they are, we don't know what is happening, we don't know why they're thinking this, we'll start to feel a little too in the head and we'll lose the character's body. We want to maintain a sense of physical connection to the world of the story. So introspection is great. Measure it out caref carefully so you don't just have giant blocks of introspection and use the introspection as part of the plot's movement. So when you're going into introspection, you're letting the character think about things that are developing their character. Like if the plot is going like this, you want the introspection to keep moving like this rather than kind of moving down as like a tangent. So now I'm just gonna move into some questions from Instagram. How do you get through the second act? Much like getting through the second draft, the second act can be difficult to get through. First of all, do not give up even though it gets harder here. It is normal for the writing process to get harder in the second act. It's not you, it's not a problem with your story if you feel suddenly the piece is harder to write. Most writers will find the second act harder to write because they lose momentum, you know, they don't have the excitement of having just started the draft. My suggestion in terms of story would be focus on the stakes. If there aren't stakes, you will lose tension. You might even feel it in your writing process. You will feel the story stagnating when there are no stakes, if there's no tension, if the character doesn't have a goal. If you really feel stuck, go back to those basic building blocks and ask yourself, what's my character's goal? What obstacles are in their way? What is at stake? Another good way to think of the middle act is that it's like an escalation of different conflicts and steps forward and then setbacks. So if you've just had a win, probably now there's a setback. But if you've just had a setback, maybe now the character can succeed. Ping pong back and forth between those things as you work towards the end of the book. I can create a whole story in my head, but getting it on paper 
I can't just seem to do. Any advice? I do see this question fairly often um, from people who are like, I can think of a story, I start writing it, and it just doesn't work. Unfortunately, there's no real way to, to say how to actually write other than you need to just physically write. I do think that that's important. If you start writing and it's not working, keep writing. Literally just keep physically writing. Type nonsense if you need to. Write it terribly if you need to, but if you keep up the physical momentum of typing or writing by hand, if you're writing by hand, you can even like never let your hand go still, like start drawing spirals if you need to. To keep your brain working, eventually you will build momentum. Very often, it's hard to know exactly where to begin your piece, and so that's why it feels like it's hard to write, because it's not beginning in a natural place that naturally opens to the story. What you need to do in that case, in my experience, is just again write, like keep writing and eventually you'll build momentum and then you can go back and write the correct beginning later. It's so simple that it's difficult, you know, it's one of those things. The answer, how do I write my, how do I actually just write my story, is unfortunately that you have to just sit down and make yourself write it. You know, you can even try dictating if that might be easier for you. How to keep from sounding preachy. My advice to keep from sounding preachy in your work, focus on the concrete storyline more than you focus on the morals. It's totally okay if you have a moral or a lesson or a theme you want to explore. Probably the character should never reflect directly on that theme, moral, or lesson. If you have a moral or lesson, that should be shown rather than told through the events that happen. If you're writing a piece where the moral is, we should care more about other people, which is true and a great moral, probably that moral will be shown through a character who doesn't care about people and then faces consequences or is put in a situation that actively teaches them to care about other people and then they start caring about other people rather than the character just thinking I should care more about other people and you too should care more about other people. That will sound preachy and honestly it's the same with themes. Theme might not be something where you're trying to teach the reader something but if the character starts just reflecting on the theme, it can sound a bit lofty. But if the theme is just integrated into the story through the events, then it should not sound preachy. How do I write about a place or time I've never been? I have two words for you, my friend, Google Street View. Obviously this doesn't work for time, but for place, Google Street View is a lifesaver. I went through a period where I was writing a bunch of stories that were set in places I've never been. Don't know why, it just made my life harder. I, I used so much Google Street View. <laughs> Literally, it's so helpful. I watched travel vlogs from those cities because what you want to see is what does the city look like when you're walking around, when you're just living your life, wandering around, like what does the city look like? And then I had people who live in those cities read the stories. What I would say with time, I've written a novel that is set historically, it's set in the 1950s, which obviously I never experienced. Google everything, even things you don't think you would have to Google. There are things where I never thought I would have to fact check them until someone was like, oh, that, that wasn't invented yet, that wasn't a thing. Like I had a scene where a character <laughs> performed CPR and then someone was like, oh, CPR did not exist in 1955, so maybe that can't happen. So literally fact check everything, even the things that in your brain you're like, no, that's fine, look it up. You never know, and better safe than sorry than write like a big plot hole into your book. <laughs> because you didn't fact check something while you were drafting it. How do you broaden your vocabulary when writing a book? I have two tips for how to broaden your vocabulary. First is to use a thesaurus. There is nothing wrong with using a thesaurus. I have one open every single time I write. Be careful just using words that you don't know. Like if there's a word you've never encountered and you're like, yikes, never heard of that word before. Apparently it means this, so I'm gonna use it. Be careful. Um, I heard this anecdote from a, a TA once who was telling us to be careful with our thesauruses. She was saying she had a friend who was writing a paper. She had a sentence that was like, he is very manipulative. And she wanted to find a, syn a synonym for manipulative because she felt she'd used the word too many times. So she plugged manipulative into a thesaurus and one of the words that come up came up was gerrymandering. Be careful using words that you don't know, but you can still learn new words that way. And then my other suggestion is to just pay close attention to what you read. When you're reading, if you encounter a cool word, write it down. I literally keep a list 
on my phone called Cool Words. <laughs> That's how I learn new words. Pros and cons of hiring a formatter versus using Vellum slash Readly Book Editor slash Kindle Creators. The pros of hiring a formatter are that they can do more complex formatting for you and this is their job and they know what they're doing. The con is that it costs money. If you don't need anything super complex, then use a free tool. Reezy Book Editor is great, like you mentioned. Um, they're great, they're easy to use and they'll look professional. But if you have like really complex formatting that you need to do, like you have illustrations or charts or anything quite complex, then you would probably need to hire a formatter. If you don't need anything complex, then you can save a lot of money by just doing it yourself with a free tool. And the final question I'm gonna answer is how to write in a busy schedule. You know, it's tricky. <laughs> I think you have to learn what works for you rather than trying to fit other people's methods into your life. Some people are gonna say that you should write in the morning. Maybe that doesn't work for you. Some people are gonna say that you should do little writing sprints throughout the day. Maybe that doesn't work for you. Some people are gonna say that you should still try to write every day even if you're really busy. That might be impossible for you. Work to your own standards with your own methods rather than to other people's standards or to their methods. They don't know you. They don't know what works for you. I would recommend start analyzing your schedule a little more for the next couple of weeks, note down when you had free time, becoming more aware of those pockets of time that maybe you could use to write. It's very tricky. It's very hard to write in a busy schedule, but it can be done. So that is all for this Q&A. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to anyone who sent in questions. Um, I tried to get through as many as I could. Hope that if you asked a question that the answer was helpful. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos from us. We've got new writing, editing, and publishing tips every Tuesday and Friday. Until next time.